keep your Bibles open to Paul and Timothy's letter to the Colossians. We are wrapping up our series on the book of Colossians, which has been subtitled, Growing in Your Place. We've been focusing on our relationship with Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord and growing in our relationship with Him during this series, growing where God has planted us. Last week, we talked about some habits we could have for the year 2020, and habits like practicing how we pray and different ways of praying, uh, conversations, practicing new ways of having conversations with people, and also practicing the skill of listening from last week. We saw that in the text. It's not too often that I get a chance to stop the flow of a, a text and just tell you what it's meant to me. And so I'm going to do that before I get into the, the text we're looking at today. The Apostle Paul is the Apostle Paul. When he wrote, he wrote the very words of God. They're authoritative. Uh, they are from God. They are true in everything they affirm. This is the Word of God. As authoritative as the letter and the words of Jesus when we have the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That's the Apostle Paul. Here's what this letter's meant to me. I met Pastor Paul in this letter. By Pastor Paul, I mean somebody who's connected to people's lives. Not somebody who just talks about great ideas and things that are important, authoritatively, truth. But I saw his heart. I picked up how important it is to be a pastor and what that means. I saw in this that Pastor Paul cares for people in the church, not merely programs in a church. By the way, he says remarkably little about the programs in the church. He's talking to people. A pastor cares for people. I learned in this letter to the Colossians that Pastor Paul labors over doing life with people. These are people he's connected to. He doesn't spend all of his time crafting brilliant sermons. He's with people. He knows people. He's doing life with people. He's with a team of people that he recognizes at the end of this letter. He's with people. He was not called to walk with Jesus alone. He's walking with Jesus with others. That's Pastor Paul. Another thing I appreciate about Pastor Paul before we get to the text this morning is that Pastor Paul brings people before God in prayer, and that's work. To bring people before God in prayer is more important than bringing people to other pastors for their praise. How big is your church? How many people? What's your attendance? How big is your building? How much cash do you have on hand? Paul doesn't talk about that. Pastor Paul brings people before God, not before other pastors. For praise. There's something important there. Another thing I've appreciated about the letter of Colossians as I've studied Paul here is that Pastor Paul is interested in changing the culture within the church, not the culture of the Roman Empire. Paul is not trying to change society. He's trying to change and see people become like Jesus, who are following Jesus. That's Pastor Paul's mission. And I've learned a lot about that and the importance of it. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul the Apostle composed this letter to people who he loved and cared about. And they're named at the end of the letter. And what I see there, and maybe you want to write this down in your outline as we begin, is the kinds of friendships you can find in Jesus. Would you write that down? The kinds of friendships that you can find in Jesus. 
Now, last week, we looked a little bit at chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. And in there, we met the letter carriers, the ones who actually carried this letter of Colossians from Paul to the church he wrote to. And they're named there in in verse 7. Tychicus and Onesimus. And they were most likely present when Colossians was composed. In fact, according to the traditions of that time, anybody who was a letter carrier typically would be part of the composition of the letter as a team, putting it together. And not only that, when it was finished, they would typically rehearse it or practice it because when they got to the destination, they didn't just hand the letter and walk away. They actually read the letter. No, they didn't read it. They performed it. It was a performance. In fact, before they left with the letter, they would typically go over it and the author would tell them. This was ancient practice, by the way. This is just ancient practice in the Roman Empire when letters were written. Because we didn't, they had a Roman postal service for only military and government correspondence, no personal correspondence. So if you had to send personal correspondence, you had to send it with somebody you knew and trusted, and they would actually deliver it and read it to the person that you sent it to. That was the custom of the day. And so Tychicus and Onesimus, they performed it before they left, they practiced it, they got there, and when they got there, when they got to Colossae, and they read this letter, they explained what Paul meant. That's called expositional preaching. They would exegete the letter and explain Paul's intention. Now, when you look at this, the end of Colossians, you're going to see a whole bunch of names. We're going to go over a bunch of names today. And um, these names also appear in the little letter we looked at before of Philemon, which is one of the reasons we believe that Colossians and Philemon were written at the same time and delivered to the same city together. In fact, on the screen, you're going to see from Philemon, verses 23 and 24, you're going to see those names. I underlined them. That's from Philemon. Those same names show up at the end of Colossians. So this is the team that Paul is with. Look with me in your Bibles, if you would, at verse 10. Colossians 4.10. Paul says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. Fellow prisoner means a co-prisoner. Uh, it was used typically of anybody who was a prisoner of war. That was the phrase. And so being in prison with Paul, it might have been a choice by this person named Aristarchus. We don't know a whole lot about this man named Aristarchus, but we do know this. He met Paul in the book of Acts. His name comes up there. It's on the screen. I want you to see the context. Where did Paul meet this guy named Aristarchus, who is now in prison with Paul? It says in Acts 19, it's on the screen, it says this. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus. There it is. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And all of them rushed into the theater together. There was going to be a mob riot. Somebody was going to get killed. Aristarchus was one of these guys who was with Paul. And if you, grabbed, if you couldn't grab Paul, grab Aristarchus. Because whatever Paul stood for, Aristarchus stood for. So if you grab Aristarchus, you've basically grabbed Paul because they're kind of joined at the hip in terms of traveling companions in friendship, which tells us something about this friend, the types of friendships we can find in Jesus. Aristarchus is a loyal friend who risks his personal safety for Paul. We saw it in Acts, and we see it in Colossians. He puts himself in danger so that Paul doesn't feel alone. He's in prison with Paul. In fact, we even believe he accompanied Paul not only to Jerusalem but to Rome, that he may have been there with Paul at the very end of Paul's life. Would you write this down? Aristarchus, the type of friendship is this. It's a friendship that would never let you be alone. A friendship that would never let you be alone. A friend that stands for everything that you stand for would never think of you being alone in prison when you're going through a difficult time. They won't leave you. That's the kind of friendship you can find with other people who follow Jesus. Paul found it. Look with me at the end of verse 10 where he says, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, who is Mark? We've met Mark before when we studied the book of Acts. Mark was prominent in the book of Acts. He's also called John Mark. 
And Mark was a member, a family member of, you can see there in verse 10, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, if you recall, Barnabas was one of the main leaders of the early Christian church. In fact, Barnabas and Paul were the first great missionary team that went out from Jerusalem to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul and Barnabas were close friends, but they had a huge argument in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas had a huge, had a sharp dispute, it says, over Mark. You see, Mark had quit an earlier missionary trip. He went home in the middle of it, and Paul does not like disloyalty. He doesn't respect people who quit halfway through a job. And so Paul had no confidence in Mark, young Mark. And so Barnabas said, no, no, let's give him another shot. Let's just, let's have him come with us on this next trip. And, they, and Paul and Barnabas had a, had a parting of the ways. They could not work together. So Barnabas took young Mark and basically mentored him and developed him for years. And he became the person Barnabas thought he could. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, did that with Mark. But Paul was done with Mark. Well, eventually Mark wrote something very important that you have in your Bibles called the Gospel of Mark. That's him. That's who wrote it. And I think what we can take away from that when it comes to friendship is we shouldn't let well-known past grievances with someone prevent the possibility of a rekindled friendship. Would you write this down? A friendship that ended but was reconciled. A friendship that ended. You had a friendship, it ended, it ended badly. There was a sharp dispute like with Mark and Barnabas. But then later there was reconciliation. Mark came back into the picture. Mark had changed. God had developed Mark's life. And now he's with Paul and he's a friend. And I think we should think about this in the church with other followers of Jesus, that we develop friendships and sometimes they go sideways and we have to part ways for a while. But then God rekindles things. I don't want us to miss out on rekindling friendships. And I think we need to give people a chance to change on God's timetable. And I can only wonder because of the parentheses. Did you see the parentheses that Paul put there? Look at what it says in verse 10 at the end. There's a parentheses. It says, you've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. You see, Paul wanted everybody to know that even though it was a well-known story that Paul and Barnabas parted ways over Mark, even though everybody knew that, Paul wanted to make sure that people knew they could trust Mark. He's changed. And he wants them to welcome Mark. I think this is an important lesson for us in terms of application that we be careful that we not pick up someone else's offense. If you hear that some Christian, a friend of yours, and another Christian friend of yours have an argument and a dispute, that you be careful that you don't pick sides, that you be careful that you don't pick up somebody's offense and hold that against, well, we don't want to welcome Mark back here. Did you hear what he did to Paul? Don't do that. What if God is doing a work in their life? What if they change? We need to extend grace to each other that we change as we follow Jesus. Imagine the friendships that you would miss out on if you eliminated everybody who you heard had a problem with someone else you knew. Look with me at verse 11. Paul and his team, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they write this, verse 11. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. I don't know. I don't have anything profound to say about Jesus of justice. This is all we know about him. This is it. There's nothing more. There's not a peep. You can't hear anything else. We don't know who this guy is except that's it. Jesus of justice. We don't know who's called justice. But Paul does say this. Look what he says next in verse 11. He says, these are the only Jews among my coworkers for the kingdom of God, and they've proved a comfort to me. In other words, Mark and Aristarchus and Jesus called Justice are the only friends that Paul had who shared Paul's background. 
his Jewish upbringing, his heritage. Now, maybe Paul thought he'd have more uh, Jewish friends than this at this point in his life, but most of them have left him for whatever reason. They're not with him. He thought he'd have a large, perhaps a large contingent of people who shared his background. Maybe he didn't because it really didn't set well with a lot of even Jewish followers of Jesus that Paul was so comfortable with Gentiles. And they just couldn't stomach that. So they weren't with him. Only three. In fact, it says in verse 11, the only emphasis, only Jews among my co-workers. In other words, there's only a few people who really know my past, who really share my past, who can really relate to my past, and yet they stick with me. In spite of knowing my past, they stick with me. And there might only be three, but I'll tell you what, those three are an incredible gift from God. What a comfort they bring me because they stuck with me. Would you write this down, number three in your outline, a friendship of comfort despite your past. That's another kind of friend you can find in Jesus, is comfort despite your past. Now let's go to the next friend. He's introduced in verse 12. His name is Epaphras. A lot of ink is spilled on Epaphras. Look at verse 12. Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, so that tells us he's from the city of Colossae. Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. From what we know, Paul probably led Epaphras to Jesus. Paul shared the gospel with him, and he came to know Jesus. And then what he did is, after Paul led him to Jesus, he went back to his hometown, Colossae, and he started a church. So Epaphras is probably the one who founded the churches in Colossae. Not only that, he went to other nearby cities. He didn't just start a church in Maple Grove. He started one in Brooklyn Park, and he started one in Plymouth. It was called Laodicea and Heropolis, just a few miles away from each other. Epaphras was the founder and planter of those churches. He was so excited to share the message of Jesus. That's what he did. Well, now he's ended up, he is in prison also with Paul. Paul calls him, in verse 12, a servant of Christ Jesus. That word servant is really soft. It actually means a slave. He wasn't a slave, but he felt enslaved to Jesus. Jesus is his master and Lord. And so that's how he saw his life. Epaphras was a slave, and he shared with Paul a heart for God's people. He shared with Paul a heart for prayer. When he couldn't be with people because of his circumstances, he was always praying. And that prayer was hard work. And he's wrestling for people. He's worried about those he's left behind. He wants to be there with him, but he can't. For whatever reason, he can't be with the people he cares so much about, but he can pray. And that's what he's known for. He's someone who prays. What does he pray for? He prays that they would mature and grow up in their relationship with Jesus, even though he can't be there to help them. He prays that they'll stand firm in Jesus, even though he can't be there to help them. He's a prayer warrior. Would you write this down? There's a friendship that we need to value with our Christian brothers and sisters. It's number four, is a friendship that brings you before God. How many of you have a friend who's not here? They haven't seen you perhaps for some time, but you know they would pray for you at any time. They bring you before God. That is a gift to have a friendship like that. Look at verse 14. He says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor. Okay, let's talk about Luke. Luke wrote a lot of the New Testament. He wrote the book of Acts and he wrote the gospel of Luke. That's Luke. 
Luke was somebody who traveled with Paul. He kept saying, we know that Luke wrote it because he kept saying, we, we went here, we went this. So Luke is a firsthand witness of a lot of Paul's ministry. But not only that, Luke is a doctor. And Luke, is, he can write really well. And he's a researcher. He's a historian. And so as he traveled with Paul and he met different Christians who knew Jesus, because Luke never met Jesus, but he would interview people like Mary. What was it like when the angel visited you? And Luke wrote it down. He visited eyewitnesses who were there, who knew Jesus, and then he recorded it. He recorded it because it was so important. He said, this is a story that we all have to remember. And the Holy Spirit was leading Luke as he was gathering all these writings and putting them together in an orderly way in Luke's gospel and in the book of Acts. And now this same Luke is here with Paul. He's very concerned that history is recorded and preserved. By the way, just as just an aside, People have often wondered, how did we get all of Paul's letters? We don't know exactly how we got them all. But there's an interesting process that happened back in the ancient world. Whenever an author would write a letter like this and compose it with the team, they would make two copies. Two copies of that letter would be written out. The handwritten copy that would be sent to the church or the person you're sending it to, to be read and performed, that was one copy. The other copy would be, another copy would be retained by the author. And we, we don't know how we got all of Paul's letters. Perhaps, perhaps all the different churches that he wrote to kept copies and they shared copies. That could very well be what happened. And then at some point, somebody compiled them all. But most likely what took place is Paul had carried all his correspondence with him, at least a copy of his letters, if not all, most of his letters. And when Paul was executed in Rome, the history records that Luke was with Paul. After his execution, it's very likely that Luke gathered up all of Paul's personal effects, including all of his letters, and that's how they all got preserved. And so Luke is very important in, how, in the reason you and I have God's word today from the New Testament. And there's a friendship that we can learn. There's something about friendship we can learn from someone like Luke. Do you have a friend who cherishes the experiences that you share with them? Maybe they've written it down. Maybe they've taken pictures. Maybe they've recorded it in some way. Maybe they pass it on. There's a value in that. Would you write this down in your outline? Number, number five, a friendship that preserves and cherishes shared experiences. That's what Luke is. He's that kind of friend. He preserves and cherishes shared experiences. Here's another friend of Paul. Let's keep looking in verse 14, in the middle of the verse He says, and Demas, send greetings. Demas. We don't know much more about Demas, but he was a longtime faithful friend. We do know this. Later in Paul's life, Demas walked away from Jesus. Demas stopped following Jesus. How do we know that? Because in Paul's last letter that he wrote, the letter of 2 Timothy, He mentions Demas. Look at the screen. Here's what Paul says at the end of 2 Timothy. He says, do your best to come to me. For Demas, same one, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Who's with him? Look at verse 11. This is the end of Paul's life. Who's with him? Luke. Luke is there. Oh, what? Who else? Bring Mark. Bring Mark to Rome. I want Mark to come. I can trust Mark. See all, these, see all these relationships, how they fit in? Because he's helpful to my ministry. And what does he also especially want? I, I, need more, I need something to write on. Bring some parchments. Bring some scrolls because I keep things with me. I keep parchments with me. I keep my letters with me, which was the common practice of the day. So what do we learn about Demas? We learn number six. Would you write this down? Sometimes we have friendships that break our heart. And they don't end well. It didn't end well with Demas. We don't know what happened. Maybe he did come back to Jesus after Paul wrote this letter. But we don't know. But Demas walked away and it broke Paul's heart. Now Paul intended for this letter to the Colossians to be passed from church to church. 
So that when he wrote, let's say he wrote a letter to the church of Maple Grove at Maple Ridge, and then he wanted us to share it with the church in Plymouth, and he wanted to share it with the church in Brooklyn Park, and that's what we wanted. And so it was a circular letter. It was meant to be passed around. And the letter I wrote to them, I want you to exchange letters because I've written letters to each of you. And we see indication of that here. Look with me at verse 15. Verse 15 says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha, in the church that meets in her house. Now, I think it's instructive that it says brothers and sisters. So we are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And when we gather for public worship, we all have a gift from God that we can use to help each other follow Jesus. And in this case, in verse 15, there's a woman who hosts and gives leadership to a church that meets in her house. She's the head of that household according to what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write. Would you write this down? Number seven, a friendship that's like a family. Brothers and sisters, we're like a family where everybody has, a, has something to contribute. Would you write that down? Look with me at verse 16. After this letter has been read to you, see to it that you also read in the church the letter to the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Now, okay, here's an example. We don't know what happened to the letter of Laodicea. We don't have record. We don't have any. It was not preserved for whatever reason. But Paul expected these letters to be shared with different churches. What do we learn about friendship from the fact that Paul expected these letters to be passed around to different churches? Here's something we learn. Would you write this down? Uh, Number eight, friendship that brings in others. Paul wanted to bring other people into what was going on. I want your church to be concerned about what's happening in the church next door. You're not an island to yourself. We need to bring each other in. We need to be pulling in the same direction. Or to use a phrase we're we're not familiar with in the Twin Cities, we need to row the boat. We need to be rowing in the same direction as a team with other churches because there are brothers and sisters in Christ. And, And we need to bring them in. We need to be be part of the same kingdom-building mission. Look with me at verse 17. Another friend. Tell Archippus, quote, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. Now, Archippus is a guy who shows up in the letter to Philemon. Same guy. We don't know much about him, but we know this. He had some responsibility in the church that was really important. He had some gifts that Paul had seen in him that Paul wants to make sure he keeps using them and he doesn't give up on using those gifts that God's given him. And so when this letter is being read, guess who's present? Archippus. It's like Paul saying, oh, by the way, I'm locking eyes with you, Archippus. Archippus, you've got a gift. Use it. Don't neglect it. Keep using your gift. You've received the ministry. Keep using it. Keep touching people's lives for Jesus. Don't give up. Would you write this down, number nine? A friendship that won't let you give up. We need friends who won't let us give up and who remind us of what God has done in our lives. And then look at verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now here's what I'd like you to do. You got that list in front of you? See that list of friendships? See, what, see the kinds of friendships that are there that you can find in Jesus? You look at that list. That, that list, you can find Jesus to be that friend. We sang already today about what a friend we have in Jesus. Look at that list, and you can see that Jesus won't let you be alone. Do you see? Look at number one. Look at number two. That you've been reconciled. Jesus is the friend that reconciles. Three, that he comforts you. In spite of your past, he stays with you and he comforts you. That's Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate friend. Jesus is the one who brings you to God in prayer. He prays for you. Jesus is that friend. Jesus says you're part of a family now. You have something to contribute. That's the friend Jesus is to you today. And Jesus won't give up on you. But you know what? Sometimes we're like Demas and we walk away. 
Now, maybe today we have some Demases here. And maybe you're back in church. It's been a long time since you've been in church. But you're back today. I want you to find that friend in Jesus and come back to him. And for the rest of us, I want us to look at this list here and realize that Jesus is our friend. That he dwells with us so that we can grow in our place. Let's pray. Before we pray, I just want to remind you that we have prayer partners who will be here at the front of the church to pray for you. If you'd like prayer, go ahead and come forward for that at the end of the service. Let's look to the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for preserving this word for our faith. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that you've given us friendships within the church. And if we have done anything that has cut off a friendship, God, would you do a work in our hearts so that we see that you, Jesus, are the friend that we need. Jesus, thank you that you dwell with us. For we pray this in your name. Amen.